So hello and welcome to Energy Transition Talk, the podcast that explores the challenges and opportunities of transitioning to a lower carbon future. I'm Paulina. I'm Justine. And I'm Jim. And we are your hosts for the Energy Transition Talk. In this podcast, we seek to break down some of the most complex and important issues regarding the energy transition and how it impacts us. In each episode, we'll tell a story by bringing you various perspectives about the energy transition so that you can make the best and most informed decisions for you and your communities. In this episode, we explore a hot topic, the future of oil and gas. In today's era of heightened awareness about the need for decarbonization, carbon has sort of become the enemy in the energy transition. But in our current global uh, reliance on fossil fuels for power, for transportation, for petrochemicals, and much more, the future world of oil and gas seems like a crucial conversation to have. So we speak with two industry veterans, Dwayne Purvis and Michael Edwards, on this very topic. We then chat with Bonner Mindy Galieva, a PhD student in petroleum engineering at the Colorado School of Mines, on how the energy transition is perceived in her home country of Kazakhstan, a major oil and gas producer, and the role that petroleum engineering plays in the energy transition. Here is my conversation with Dwayne and Michael. Uh, Michael Edwards is a visionary leader who combines corporate and strategic planning social communities, ESG, policy and technology innovation to drive positive change into the energy industry. She is an avid advocate for social change, digital transformation and energy transition. And we're also delighted to have Dwayne Purvis here with us today, who is a petroleum engineer and environmental scientist who specializes in greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions, monitoring the orphan well management. He's a consultant based in Dallas, Texas, and an expert on the energy transition for the oil and gas sector. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you, Paulina. Glad to be here. Um, So maybe to start things off a bit, could you let us um, know or share a bit about how you two know each other? I I understand that um, there was a connection before this podcast. Go ahead, Michael. That's really funny. Thank you so much, Paulina. Dwayne and I actually connected on the energy transition, exactly what we're talking about today. We are in this uh, mind frame of discovery and and always feeling as if there's something else out there. So we welcome this conversation and, and just emphasize that, you know, on where I like to lead others is that, you know, this is an act of discovery. It is a journey. We are learning as we're going. Uh, even though we do emphasize we need a roadmap as well. So, Duane, I'll let you have your version. I'm just so pleased to have met you, by the way. Yeah, yeah no, I'm pleased to meet you too. I, uh, it's a kind of ironic because you come from a large company drilling and production. I come from a small company in private uh, and consulting companies in reservoir. So kind of different disciplines but we did, we both ended up in the same places trying to talk with the industry about the same issues, um, including the energy transition, both what we do and uh, how we do it. Could you share a bit about yourselves, um, your careers, your decision, um, Dwayne, to go back to get a degree in environmental science and for you, Michael, to um, how you think of new technologies uh, and how they relate to the oil and gas industry? So uh, I did go back to school. Uh, I earned a degree in sustainable energy from Johns Hopkins. So it's really a policy degree. The, the impetus was my observation that the industry was beginning to change and that it would continue to change and pretty radically. Um, so then I just tried to decide, well, what do I do about this? And I decided, decided that uh, policy issues were the most similar to the kinds of reservoir issues I had solved in the past, the kind of problems I enjoy. And so uh, that's, that's what I studied. And I, I believe that what uh, I learned in the policy field is going to be very relevant to strategic decisions by oil and gas. Over to me. I see the pointer there, Wayne. Uh, (laughs) Where do I start? I've been working in policy for about a decade now. And for many that know, I I was on leadership. I uh, 
was uh, leading technology deployment in the Gulf of Mexico before uh, Deepwater Horizon. And I was in source control, um, interfacing with a wide variety of policyholders. And, um, and that's what I did after um, a condo as we restarted operations in the Gulf of Mexico is I was leading external engagements with our regulators around the world, trying to make a difference and to prevent this ever from happening again. Uh, I started out of the university as a field engineer, one of the first females, um, as you can imagine, uh, running pipe on a deep water uh, rig, um, learning uh, new technology. Um, I worked in the North Sea, South America and around the world. Um, I was asked to go work for an entrepreneur out of Aberdeen, Scotland, and we we revolutionized the way that we drill today. We doubled the length of uh, laterals in the Austin Chalk at the time. And that really was where I started thinking around how effectively we are bringing in new technologies. That was a huge uh, insert of VC capital. And the overall investment is still seen as one of the most successful uh, technology to concepts to market. I went to work for Exxon Chemical in uh, developing the first flow assurance group. And then I ran the six divisions of Baker Hughes for deep water. Um, I came to BP really um, to work for a friend of mine that convinced me that what I was doing would make a difference in an operator. And to be quite honest, I thought I would be there for a couple of years, getting an insider view of what an operator thinks about technology. And then I would go back out to that, um, you know, to the certain sector and do what I know best. But I stayed at BP for almost 15, 16 years, and I'm so happy I did. So I'm the inventor of the first um, drilling advisor system, the first of its kind. And you can imagine back in the day when this was first developed, there was not a digital strategy. There was no Bing, there was no Siri, and those technologies were not streamlined. So I was a believer of the collaboration and partnerships, which is why Dwayne and I uh, talk about how do we, how do we create a more alignment uh, in these spaces? So deploying that tech, what I did um, within BP for the first half of my career, and then I was asked to be on leadership in the Gulf of Mexico to do just that, deploy technology. That is all fascinating. And I, 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 I've read and I've seen that you're a trailblazer. So I very much appreciate you sharing your experience and the behind the scenes aspect of all of that. Um, so you both mentioned that you met through the energy transition and could you maybe share a bit from your own perspectives of what does the energy transition mean to you and what do you think that um, why it's a major challenge in the oil and gas industry? Uh, well, the, the reason it's a challenge, I guess, is pretty obvious. It requires us to do things that we, differently than we've done before. But in North America, we have a, a compound issue, and that is uh, that the geology here is very, very mature. The earliest production in the world was in the U.S. In, in the 1890s, the global epicenter of oil production was Ohio. Um, so we're farther along this maturity spectrum, and we have a different set of challenges here than other places like uh, Abu Dhabi and Russia, which are still increasing or holding production. If it's going to take handling differently both what we do and uh, the new projects we take on. So Dwayne, right, you know, when we think about the energy transition, different places around the world, and you know, when we fly and we land in a country where we see poverty, uh, we can soon see that there's no access to, to energy. So thinking about the social impact of energy, bringing light, mobility, heat to our communities is very critical. I am on the advisory committee and I'm a judge for the Switched On series by Scott Tinker. So we talked about Scott at University of Texas. He's our um, governor of Texas, uh, uh, or geologist, uh, let me put it that way. So he um, often likes to remind us of the social impact. I do a, I do consulting on ESG, and I often like to remind people of the social impact because that's why we're talking about the environment. Because if we're not talking about the wider issues of social impact, we're going to miss some major innovations 
we're going to miss the forest from the trees when we're counting a scope one, two, and three emissions. So I'm just going to leave it that way. I do think that there's some pretty interesting breakthrough technologies in this wider space, but nowhere in our history have we seen the public's demand for cleaner sources of energy and our education on what energy means. So I think our consumer base is becoming a lot more educated on where our sources of energy are coming from. Absolutely. Um, and Dwayne, I understand that you have a particular interest in wealth and at the end of their economic life, and they plunged yeah. into abandoned wells. So could you share a bit about this and maybe- Yeah, sure. But how I unsexy is that? Hey, Dwayne, I really, I hear you're really into stale old dead wells. Um, no, what I, what I got to realizing was um, that in the, in the biggest picture, we've got to do two things. One is change the way we do our operations to be cleaner. And then we have to do new kinds of operations. So under the headline of changing the way we do operations, uh, we have got to reduce our methane emissions. If we don't drive emissions less than 0.2% uh, of total gas from wellhead to burner tip, then we're worse off from a GHG perspective than using coal. But we also have to, as part of that reduction, decommission our wells. And what I found in my reservoir engineering work is the projects coming across my desk got, um, technically speaking, they got crappier and crappier. Uh, and so I, I realized that these projects, uh, some of these projects just didn't have enough money left in them. And they're being transacted, but they didn't have enough money left in them to pay for their decommissioning, or they just barely did. And so I put those two together and I say, look, if people are going to make some really bad investments and they're and or they're going to end up orphaning their wells, going bankrupt, leaving the wells to the taxpayers to take care of. Well, if the taxpayers are going to take it over, well, they're going to be really mad at us. They'll be on the hook for hundreds of billions of dollars, um, potentially, and, and we risk losing um, our license to operate, besides the fact that the orphan wells uh, tend to, to leak and have, have problems. So I, I've came to the issue um, from my background in helping companies make strategic decisions and investments, and from the fact that this is an essential part of what our industry must do to meet um, the role we want, uh, to, which is to help the world and not to harm it. And maybe for those of us uh, listening that may not be as familiar with orphan wells, um, and, and you might <laughs> That's a good point. Let's set the basis definition. Um, so there is a bit of a, of a nomenclature problem around this issue. So when the, when the public says uh, there's a, an abandoned well, they mean the same thing as an abandoned building. It's deserted and dilapidated, but you do know who the owner is. Uh, an orphan well has a technical meaning, and that is uh, it's deserted uh, and left to rot, but it has no identifiable responsible party. So it becomes a ward of the state. The state becomes responsible for it. Uh, so the, the issue that I'm concerned with is uh, partly orphans, which are the end of the process, uh, but also uh, foster wells, micro producers, idle wells, long-term idle wells, and this this whole progression of wells. Um, it used to what well, we still use the term uh, stripper, and as a as a low producing well, but that is defined as a ten barrel a day, or in federal court a fifteen barrel a day. But uh, in today's world, fifteen barrels a day onshore U.S. is actually a pretty good well. About a third of all of the onshore producers that are still producing, but not um, not shut not shut in, still producing, are less than one barrel of oil equivalent per day. Mm -hmm. um, so we we really need another. Uh, we need to have a conversation about this this whole progression, and uh, including these micro producers. Absolutely, and you mentioned that they are with these orphan wells that there are leaks or that they have problems. Um, what other environmental or social impacts are underlying uh, behind these orphan wells? So what happens if we don't plug our wells? And they actually had more answers than me. Um, not all wells leak, 
but plenty do, especially methane and um, releasing methane into the air uh, does absolutely no good for anybody. Um, they can leak water, they can leak other fluids, they can contaminate groundwater, though not very often. Um, but they can also cost us our social license to operate. They can invoke higher costs for bonding, higher costs for insurance, and greater regulation. Um, and ironically, it's the conscientious operators who are going to disproportionately bear the responsibility because they're the ones who will still be around, preferentially, after the, the less conscientious leave. So it's, it's incumbent, maybe I'm getting pretty far afield from your question, but it's, in, it's incumbent on uh, those conscientious of us to bring the issue to bear to protect uh, ourselves, our operations, and the industry. So I serve on a well integrity board, and this has been a live historical conversation for, you can imagine, way before our careers uh, about how you plug and abandon wells properly. And we do that. We do that as wells engineers. That is my background. Um, and we want to assure that the latest technologies are plugging those wells. We typically, uh, you don't have gas leaks. I mean, that that's during a production. You're producing most of your, your gas anyway. These are depleted reservoirs and the leaks are very rare. Second um, is this is actually an opportune space for innovation. And what is so exciting right now is that we're having a wider conversation on innovative ways to take plug and abandon wells yeah. and turning them into geothermal. We have technology now that we can actually stimulate heat downhole. We don't have to look for high heat in the earth's surface to drill to. We can actually go into plugged or what we would think is a plug and abandoned well or orphan well, like uh, Dwayne mentioned, and actually make this and convert it into a geothermal well. I'm hoping that uh, USC is going to talk to Jamie Beard, but I'll, I'll call out that she is doing a fantastic job in educating on geothermal. Yeah, and and uh, she is, and there are some really cool potentials there. The, but this is back to a, to nomenclature issue. So plugged wells you're rare, rarely leak, but it's the long, it's the orphan long term idle, the ones that aren't plugged yet and aren't producing. That's uh, that's a different ball. It's still a minority. It's still a minority of the wells. Um, Absolutely. So the other exciting area of uh, innovation is. I did a panel talk and Exxon was my keynote and I pushed them to talk about how they're repurposing these wells. And like Dwayne said, you know, even if they're not plugged, these could be repurposed. So we pushed them to, to talk a bit about how they're redesigning fields to do carbon capture. And it's thinking about a life cycle of a well in a much broader sense than just we need to plug and abandon it that maybe if we have reservoir space and we have the, the cap rock that we can actually take our emissions from one side of the field and actually inject them and capture the carbon. So exciting things about this ha are happening. And I think a wider conversation because of the energy transition conversation that we're thinking innovative ways. And there is a, there's a, a situation in which being pushed causes us to innovate and bring something we wouldn't have otherwise found, but it's a great idea. And I, I think there's some, there are some great ideas on how to repurpose old wells. I'm not sure how broadly they'll be applicable, but, but we can plan from the beginning, and you'd know better than me, Michael, but you can plan from the beginning some sort of post-production use and perhaps design the, the well to have a second life or the, the platform or the whatever. Is, is that a fair assumption? It is. Um, I, I do have a, a question. Uh, you're talking about these uh, newer te technologies to plug wells, but also uh, different uh, new technologies that are within the oil and gas industry. So what do you think are maybe challenges of adopting these new technologies that you've encountered or that you can see um, like throughout the, the field. You want, Dwayne, you want to go for that one first? Yeah, well, these are all new ideas. They've, they've just, uh, I've just been following them last year and a half. But there's a, a bunch of ideas popping up. Uh, but they're all pretty early stage. Um, they're going to 
uh, they've been piloted. Maybe, maybe some of them are still theoretical, but none of them that I know of have gone past a couple of pilots. Um, so we're very early in the deployment cycle, which means there's still a lot of opportunity in front of us if they can do it. Uh, Michael, what do you think? How do we get it done? Oh, we need to get it done. The operators, we love to talk about the operators not having robust technology deployment. There are things that are in the way, um, and it's not about money. It's actually about a culture of, of innovating and continuous improvement. Back in the day, we had a, a ability to, to, to have safe testing of uh, technology that was offline but in parallel, where we were inclu including our service providers, our rig contractors, and a wider sense the government. Um, and so we need to be thinking more broadly about how we do that. We did a we did an interesting survey on the digital data science board that I sit on with the spin. So you, you think about how you can see the spin coming into major corporations. And we discovered a couple of interesting tag points. One was we found that almost 80, 85 percent of all spin in the new digitization within the operators were on proof of concept not on deployment. That to me has switched. It used to be that it was 80% 80 spend on deploying technology and scaling it up with 20% R&D and proof of concept. It's done the other way. It begs the question around what is our internal focus on ramping up technology that we know. Some of this technology we're calling new. It's been out for decades and we're just not able to streamline it. And it really comes with the integration of different systems. It's how I think about the whole energy transition as a total system. You, we should be thinking about technology deployment as a total system as well. Um, and thinking of the future of oil and gas um, and going forward, what changes do you see in the energy transition um, and how does it relate to different concerns with climate change? And as you were saying, like green energies, green hydrogen, um, what the Arfun wells, how do you foresee kind of this conversation going forward? I'm one of these doers and, you know, I, in my consulting, this is interesting. I'm getting calls from, you know, corporate people uh, that I've known, but I also am advising startups. And this is fascinating how to sort through what are the major problems? And I often ask, okay, what's the pain point you're trying to solve? And there's a lot of good ideas out there, but there's not a lot of clarity sometimes, not all the time, but clarity um, on what problem are we trying to solve? And do, do your customers believe that is a problem? And is that not just a problem, is it a pain point for here and now? Is it compelling enough for change? Because we are going through a huge change the transition means very different things, as we mentioned earlier, to different, even pockets of the United States even. Um, and I do believe that the intent is good because it's begging questions from the consumer. Us in the upstream have actually been far removed from the consumer for many, many years. And the downstream and the utilities actually have been right there. That's one of the reasons why we had ERCOT. When I think about a wells um, utility, I think, wow, we have wells in the ground that we're not utilizing. Well, how can we best utilize that for the energy system? I think about, a, you know, yesterday I had a conversation with some landowners who were thinking about their geothermal capability within their community. And just something as simple as where is your utility connection? They're thinking off the grid. And there are pockets of our organization and community that they're going to have to have different technologies, battery sources, and it's not always assumed that we're going to be connected to the grid. So this is really interesting strategies that we're having to think a lot more broadly on. And it does mean that our robust um, nature of our robust organizations for deploying technology does need to go and need to be re-looked at, re-examined, because I don't think we're there yet. We, I think we were probably there 10 years ago, maybe. So 
So I, I think of the energy transition today as about where the internet was in the mid nineties. At this point, everybody knows the idea, but nobody really knows what's going to happen. And we're going to go through cycles and versions. There'll be a bunch of technologies that work well at the beginning. Um, think AOL. And then they'll peter out. And there'll be some technologies that'll come and they'll predate their application. Anybody remember the Edison? Uh, the smartphone, functionally, without a phone, the, the tablet from uh, Apple in the 90s. Um, what about pets.com, right? But Amazon started as a bookstore and became something much, much more. We'll go through a, a lot of changes and a lot of evolution. And we, it'll be just really, really hard to predict what the end game's going to be. But we will keep moving and it, it'll move pretty fast. And I, I want to go back to this idea of sharing lessons learned um, and also thinking about our listeners, some that might be in a specific position and others that might be aspiring to um, kind of advancing in their careers. So what advice would you give a CEO um, or a policymaker of an oil and gas producer where these um, issues are coming up, how to ethically promote their green credentials and seizing the opportunities of the energy transition in the years to come? This is a small question. This is a small question. Look, the, I think that one of the biggest issues facing companies is one of the biggest issues facing people who are challenged with change and that's ego defense. We, we have to be willing to say that we have to do something different. We have to be willing to say that there's something different to be done. And a lot of what we've done uh, was the best we knew, but, but now we do know more. Uh, and as I look forward, I, I see the energy transition as a great opportunity. There's, yes, it has required doing something, not doing some things we've done in the past, but what have we done if not understand the subsurface, if not take risks, if not um, drill wildcat wells? The, the capital, the technical skill, the logic, the thinking, all of that fits on the energy transition just beautifully. So the energy transition, I think, is to the CEO, it's the greatest threat to those who are the most inflexible. And it's the greatest opportunity to those who are willing to see it. Excellent. I, uh, I had a bit about management change, but I also want to remind, and I guess I just build off of the, the challenge and the why. You know, first of all, your, your challenge and your why, but joining it up to what you're doing in your leadership behaviors every day is our challenge. And leading in an area of discomfort is, is where I think the big breakthroughs are. I think uh, when you are listening to your employees, by the way, the majority of them have the answer. You don't have to come up with the answers. And coming back and just listening, your intent, your behavior, the way that you govern, uh, your listening sessions, very, very important. I do think these unlocking big ideas, we're coming out of a, you know, a, a very tough time globally, not just uh, the US, the threat of recession, that there are many leaders that are not in the right mindset and they're in a survival mode. And I think we just need to recognize that, that we do need to have some pauses on some leaders and to raise up those that are actually leaning into the discover, uh, discomfort. And they're very small, and there's very small percentage of those leaders out there. And you can see them. They usually are the ones shining, and they're the ones innovating, and they're listening to their people. That's a great point. It, it, it does take leadership, and particularly a skill in change management. And this idea of talking to the people and these leaders and also thinking of stakeholders, of policymakers, of um, the work that also has been kind of taking place from the ground up to secure a fair and just transition. Uh, what can we say to communities that depend on oil and gas uh, to adapt and change with the energy transition? Another I small question. Again, I, I, I'm going to jump in here. One is telling them is one thing but listening i think is much more effective 
Yeah. I've got major examples. Um, and I, I think about a community uh, that was forced to put solar panels on their farmland. Um, and it was a quite an interesting turn of events. And I won't go into details, but if the wider conversation was about social impact, we probably would have made a different decision that was more integrated. Um, they didn't have reliable sources of energy. They did not have their farming uh, land that they had five generations that had been handed down from their family. But these are uh, these are decisions need to be thought out in a much wider sense than where they are today, in my view. And, and just transition applies to people in Africa and also to people in Appalachia and Northwest Wyoming and Central California. And I, I, some of the policies have begun to address that, provided money for for, re for training, for example. Um, but we have not yet seen a policy that's been very good at helping people uh, find employment in the new jobs. Now, one of my hopes is that if we're gonna decommission a couple million wells, that we could put a lot of people to work for a long time to do that. Um, but I, I don't think that's a permanent solution, maybe a significant part of a, of a solution. What would be your advice for young energy professionals that are kind of dipping their toes in, in this field? So I'd probably split that uh, split that up a little bit, but for everybody, I would say diversify, cultivate options. You're not going to be able to spend your whole career just extracting hydrocarbons. Um, well, if you're if you're starting out now, you won't. Um, now the the geophysicists are going to go first, and the, ge the geologists, reservoir engineers, the production engineers are going to sweep the floors and lock the doors, but there will be a decreasing employment on the whole. But there's a lot of the skills that are transferable. Well, the landmen have transferable skills. Geologists have transferable skills. And reservoir engineers have transferable. And you're prudent to develop a broader skill set than just extraction of hydrocarbons. Um, you, the same knowledge of the subsurface uh, with some experience in other places can provide the longevity that you need. I agree. You know, going back to the energy system, I'd invite those that that have a challenge with our industry to join it because being part of the solution, being part of the mix and being part of this redefinition of what energy means to our communities is your future. I mean, it is your lights, it is your heat and mobility as well. And so what better way to, to change that system to, to join it? We need more people thinking differently. Um, and then again, the, the communities are being heard, the population is being heard. And I think this again is historical uh, to things that we've never heard, have seen before. So. Uh, we need to, to unify a lot more than where we are. I, I believe we're being a lot more divisive on, I actually think they're a little bit more petty of issues than, than the bigger issues, which is keeping a, a reliable, ac accessible energy source uh, to our communities. So let's be for something, not against something. Uh, I very much appreciate those insights. and. We're kind of coming up uh, at the very end of our episode, and I know that there were ideas that you shared earlier that you maybe wanted to build on, but my question would be, is there anything that you would like to add, any any other part of um, this whole conversation that you feel is important for us to uh, include into the conversation that we've had or that you would like to build on that maybe it was lingering and didn't find a place to um, include it previously. I know. I, I, I think the only thing, and Dwayne brought this up, which is jobs. So I, I serve on an automation board. It's a global board. We do research uh, with Norway and, and here in the States as well. And we're looking to promote more interoperability between our systems, which are currently very siloed. In order to take uh, you know, these digital systems to AI, we need to be more integrated. But we often hear this story about we're eliminating jobs. And we actually have done many studies on this. This is not just the first time, but we're actually creating more jobs right now 
as a result of the digital solutions. We're changing the mix of them and we're getting really good feedback from our operations. And you think about that some of these individuals that have been schooled only on hardware and now they're they're looking into their problem in a different way. The insights of that integration of in that experience is so important. It's unlocking some new ways of how we think about user experience uh, on our field, uh, digital systems as well. But that's that's all I have for today, and I'm so appreciative of this conversation. Thanks, Dwayne. Enjoyed yeah, it. Thank you. Well, Thank you both so much for your time and for joining Energy Transition Talk. And until next time. Now we'll have a conversation with Valnur Mindigalieva, a PhD student in petroleum engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. So in, in this podcast, we've got the, the really great um, pleasure of, of speaking with Valnur Mindigalieva. Uh, she is a PhD student in petroleum engineering at the Colorado School of Mines and is a native of Kazakhstan. We want to explore a little bit about that different international perspective that Valnur will bring uh, to our podcast here. And it, so we're following along in the this, this episode on the future of oil and gas. Obviously, you have energy professionals like Valnur who will be that future of oil and gas. So we want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to work for uh, work with us. To start out, just a, a brief introduction of yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background, why you decided to study petroleum engineering, why in the United States, what what is it that you're doing within your PhD work? Thank you, Professor Crompton. Firstly, I would like to thank USC Viterbi uh, School of Engineering and uh, Dr. Irasher Shagi and uh, their Shagi uh, Center on Energy Transition. And of course, uh, Professor Crompton for this unique opportunity to share my story and uh, uh, my perspectives. So as mentioned, I am originally from Kazakhstan and I was born and raised in this little town called Aktobe in northwestern side. And uh, growing up, I was always about numbers and uh, physics uh, problems. And I also had this passion for painting. So I was uh, entertaining of a thought of pursuing art, but I also understood the challenges with that profession. Um, and, you know, I wasn't from a wealthy background and it was my uh, strong, hardworking single mom who uh, became a role model for me. And I've always wanted to make sure that I achieve the goals, you know, to provide her with a um, peaceful retirement. So that's why I started looking into engineering and like petroleum engineering. And it's no surprise because Kazakhstan, you know, it's one of the biggest oil and gas producers. Uh, in the Central Asia. And I also understood uh, that uh, education overseas would be a great opportunity because uh, from my perspective, sometimes it is hard to get, um, you know, into successful, like get a successful career in oil and gas in Kazakhstan sometimes without connections especially as a female engineer. And uh, this country fortunately provides these opportunities that are quite achievable. And uh, yeah, and then through my mom's friends of a friend, um, I actually got to learn about New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology or New Mexico Tech, which was a quite a good and affordable school. And um, uh, that's how I started my journey in New Mexico. and. That's where I was fortunate to uh, work as an undergraduate student at Petroleum Recovery Research Center um, allocated on campus. And uh, shout out to Dr. Balch and Dr. Ampua for their uh, mentorship and guidance, uh, where I got to uh, learn about CCUS, which is Carbon Capture Utilization Storage. They had a project uh, um, on that topic. and. Uh, Ever since I just became fascinated with uh, oil and gas uh, in general and the things we can do with the skill set. And I uh, discovered the passion for reservoir engineering. And that's how I decided to pursue more 
school or education. So I ended up um, <clears throat> getting into Colorado School of Mines to do more research. And I'm fortunate to work with Dr. Kazumi, who's a truly living legend and make the, these connections uh, that are very um, important and playing a pivotal role in shaping me as an engineer, uh, such as Dr. Miskimins and Professor Crompton. Oh, Dr. Kazumi is indeed a living legend, and so is Dr. Ashagi uh, from the, on the U.S. side of the campus here. But um, they, I'm sure they both know each other very well. In this podcast, we really want to, we're really trying to stress that every voice matters and, you know, that that your voice matters, which is why we're, we're delighted to have you on here. So with the topic being energy transition and the future of oil and gas within that transition, what does energy transition mean to you personally? And then how do you see it maybe different between your home country and the, the friends and family you have back there and then what you have seen in the United States? Right. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. So when I think of energy transition, I typically like to break down things so we can see that it is composed of two words, right? Energy and transition. When it comes to energy, it's like us as human beings, we need energy to move around, um, to do activities, whether mental or physical. And uh, also we need energy to like power our homes or gadgets that we use, right? And when we speak about transition, um, it's essentially a, a change um, between one matter or state or condition into another. And I feel like nowadays, uh, when it comes to energy transition, we define it as a um, fundamental shift or change between the energy uh, resources in terms of its production, distribution, consumption. So in a sense, like um, shift between usage of traditional resources or fossil fuel based like petroleum and natural gas or coal to cleaner energies or more sustainable like wind, solar, etc. right? Which are great. And the question here is why? So, right? And it's because of the necessity and the need to uh, mitigate and fix the climate change issues, also um, mitigate environmental degradation and uh, achieve the social equity. And I think all these definitions and ideas are um, quite strong and I agree with those, but what I think is important is to realize that the energy transition should be more of a strategic movement that involves the collaboration between these different mixes of energy sources because we need to realize that we are reaching 8 billion people nowadays and the demand of energy is um, very high and uh, meeting those demands just by removing uh, fossil fuel based resources is not realistic. And also we need to understand such things as, uh, let's say, using solar power or those solar panels, uh, once they exceed their life expectancy, uh, what's gonna happen and understand the materials they're built of, because some of them could be hazardous and things like that. So I think um, by collaborating together as a team, uh, in this energy sector, we can actually achieve the goals of actually um, mitigating the climate issues and not to do that at the price of environment and human lives. And moving to the second part of your question, that's something what I find fascinating about this country is that people are very aware about the reality of this issue and there are a lot of um, activities that have been um, taken by um, different parties from the face of governments, um, schools, um, academia, industry that are trying to make their solutions, innovative solutions. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, with the existing um, 
industry of petroleum and oil and gas trying to uh, be more responsible in uh, tracking emissions per se and things like that. So that's very good. As for Kazakhstan, uh, what I'm noticing is that the country is becoming more and more aware of uh, this abilities that uh, can be done in regard to achieving the or providing um, the opportunity for the people to use renewable energy. Uh, and for instance, I was actually talking to a friend of mine from Kazakhstan, whom I met here at Mines, and he gave me this link to a group chat that has like 7,000 people where people just having discussions and sharing the um, current news and the things that our companies are doing to uh, be uh, more responsible to um, start having the discussions on um, innovations that can be done in the country, right? And they even created what they call an energy transition club, which actually was um, created by Bolashak. Uh, petroleum club and Bolashak is the government funded program that helps people to uh, get education outside of Kazakhstan in different spheres like petroleum engineering. So these people, they come, they get their education here, and then they are bringing it back to our country to um, make or uh, provide the opportunities to uh, have um, a better quality of life. Uh, that's that's interesting. I mean, I had the opportunity once to visit your country, and to visit the giant uh, Tengiz oil field, and all nice. of the old timers on their desk had this really interesting look. It looked like modern art. You said you wanted you studied art, uh, but uh, it it was it looked like a glass sculpture of sorts. And when mm -hmm. I asked them what they were, what was all about, that was actually molten desert sand that had been burned. There was a very famous, famous may not be the right word, but in the post -so in the Soviet era, though uh, there was a very big blowout. And the, of course this reservoir is so large that it did, right. I, I think it burned for a year before they were able to, to actually put it out. Is there a, I think I know the answer to this question from your last thing, but is there a growing sense of the environmental impact of oil and gas and then how maybe th th how things have to change uh you mean in kazakhstan in kazakhstan yes definitely i mean uh people uh, in media and uh, among uh, professionals are becoming more uh, brave about having those discussions about in a sense, I'd say even starting to make some changes, whether it's in the work culture, to become more responsible and uh, reaching the solutions and the necessary um, uh, protocols to, uh, you know, to be better, to be better because uh, oil and gas itself is very important source of energy in country. And of course, uh, it's important to uh, make sure that, um, you know, the, the right uh, policies are in place and uh, the right guidelines are in place. And I'm seeing it more. Um, and of course, I don't have experience working in Kazakhstan, but I have a number of friends that have been uh, involved in projects there for years. And that's what they're telling me, that they are starting to see this trend. Um, but it's all about the right momentum, I think. So hopefully it will pick up and uh, uh, even more. Uh, and it seems like it has the potential. Well, that's that's good to hear. I mean, that, when you um, being in, in the United States and, the, and seeing the, the media uh, 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 interest in, in climate change and, and in energy transition, and you hear it almost nightly or weekly uh, on a lot of different newscasts. A lot of that message is anti-fossil fuel and is almost, uh, you know, make that change that you said needs to be done very responsibly. Do you, and some people even suggest this may be the end of the fossil fuel industry. How do you feel when that statement it, it comes out? Right. So firstly, 
I think that the statement of it's the end of fossil fuels is um, uh, dramatic or a little extreme because um, as I mentioned earlier with the population size that we're having uh, nowadays the petroleum and oil gas is a very reliable uh, source of energy that can meet those demands and it's the source of energy that can help uh, the renewable sector to become more prominent so that's why I think um, it has um, a future, a longer future than uh, the media portrays it, right? And another thing, um, I was actually just reminded myself of this uh, quote. This, there is this quote by Abai Kunanbaev, who is a, a very famous poet, composer, and um, philosopher. And his, his quote is, um, who poisoned Socrates? Uh, who burned Jean d'Arc, who buried Muhammad in camel remains, crowd, but the crowd doesn't have a mind. So make sure to guide the crowd to the truth. So the way I portray uh, guidance to the truth is that us people in academia or in the industry um, that worked in, whether it's petroleum engineer sector or any sort of subsurface energy related sector, we can do, um, a better job of uh, communicating that to the people um, in a sense of promoting the um, education, promoting the empathy and um, our, our experience. And I think that would be uh, beneficial in um, actually expediting the necessary goals that the transition set uh, through a true collaboration. Well, art and philosophy, you're really changing the next generation of petroleum engineers, that's for sure. Yes. Um, the, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I know you're very active on, in student organizations, particularly the student SPEs uh, group in, uh, at, at, on campus. But at the, you know, the, the numbers show that the number of students that are enrolling in petroleum engineering, particularly in North American universities, is declining. Now, some of that is following the commodity price cycle and the rest of that. But what would you sell, tell a, a prospective uh, engineering student who's going to mines about what to consider petroleum engineering as their discipline? Right. Um, I think that when it comes to petroleum engineering education, it's a, a very strong program that provides you with all the necessary skills that can be applicable to any sorts of um, subsurface energy related problems. Because you get a feel of uh, learning the geologic side of things as well as just analytical skills that you get to gain. And, um, and I think that we as petroleum engineers still have uh, an important role to play and as you mentioned the number of students is declining but the workforce will need us so uh, that's why i'm encouraging to people to consider and look into uh, these programs and also understand that uh, whichever skills you get to learn you can further apply uh, to other sides of energy and for instance i'm a great example i am a petroleum engineer i work on a number of projects that include petroleum and geothermal systems and i get to uh, use the fundamentals of oil and gas uh, well testings to geothermal systems and another thing is that uh, nowadays we live in a very fast paced world and um, the energy sector, the petroleum engineering sector is doing a great job in being adaptive to that by uh, being innovative and um, and also in the education sector, uh, our classes are top notch trying to uh, keep up with the uh, current trends to provide the students with the necessary skills in um, data analysis as well. Well, you kind of uh, naturally segue to my next question about skill sets. Um, clearly, you know, right now everybody thinks AI and machine learning and all of that is the cool new thing to get into. So, and that's that's true at most universities where 
enrollment in uh, computer science is up. How would you say, I mean, the oil and gas industry hasn't always been thought of as high tech or digital. It's kind of been the 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 physical that dirty aspects of it have been the the well blowouts and stuff like that usually are the are the pictures that people have in their minds. How would you uh, talk about the need to for a petroleum engineer to to really be at the top of their game with regard to digital literacy? Right. Um, I think it is very important and crucial. As I said, uh, this is a, a new era essentially right now uh, we have so much data coming in and we have uh, so many problems that need to be solved fast right the examples you provided and that's where i think having the uh, skills with how to work with the data is um, very helpful because let's say uh, something is going on and you need a solution quick, that's where you can actually apply the engineering knowledge you have with the data analysis skills you have to build a, a tool that can do uh, the necessary quick calculations for you right there, right? So I think, uh, of course, it is still important to have a strong foundation because engineering in petroleum is still is um, based on the uh, physics of the fluid flow and porous media or the mechanics uh, of the uh, different equipment and the rock properties and all of that. So understanding the necessary governing uh, equations is one thing and having that understanding will actually help you to build a better tool, a smarter tool, a more efficient tool that is reliable. And this way you can actually use your engineering judgment uh, to uh, quantify uh, the results you would get or have an idea that whatever you are receiving from a tool or a program or a workflow is actually uh, adequate. One kind of last thing as we come uh, to the end of this uh, this really good conversation, um, some uh, we kind of went from one side and said, well, let's get rid of oil and gas, and you you answered that question. But what about the whole concept that a petroleum engineer is actually essential to solve the energy transition challenges? Right. I think um, that's that's what I um, strongly agree with. A uh, petroleum engineer is quite essential because we have such a long history of trial and errors we went through. Uh, and I think the rest of the energy sector, energy sector should <clears throat> use our experiences as, um, as an example, as the reference to learn from. And um, petroleum engineering uh, professionals, I would call them as like seasoned players in this game and we can sort of mentor the rest of the energy sector to um, succeed. And for instance, like a geothermal case, it still involves, uh, I guess in the case that I am um, focusing on right now, which is enhanced geothermal systems, that's where you dr uh, drill deeper wells and you're trying to reach deeper hot formations, but you're still using the techniques of, let's say, drilling engineering, trying to uh, successfully uh, reach your target. So having this um, knowledge and experiences there, we can actually work together to tune up and have a better solution for a particular system that, um, let's say, this team is working on. And so, yeah, and at the end of the day, petroleum engineers are the um, engineers that are here to uh, make sure to provide reliable, affordable energy source uh, to the communities, to the society, and to provide and share our, our knowledge and collaborate with other um, energy sectors uh, to um, achieve uh, the sustainability goals. Well, that's, a, that's a very good insight, Ed. So just to end here, well, I want to let you get the last word in. Uh, one of the purpose of our podcast is to reach out to the, uh, to the maybe the non-technical community, your maybe your friends and family, or the people that you would uh, meet outside of school. What are in in terms of all of this? What do you think are the real the key takeaways, the important points 
that everybody should, uh, uh, you know, should really think about and consider when they're a energy consumer or an energy voter or, you know, being in the community and not just leave it to the experts, but they have to get involved. What are your key points and key messages to them? Right. I think the key message is just uh, to understand that the whole uh, case with energy transition, it's not as simple as sometimes it could be portrayed. It's a complex, complex process. It's not just as easy as flicking a switch. So understanding that I think is important when I talk to my friends or my family. And at the end of the day, everything um, begins with just one person. So if you start um, doing one little step on one little thing in uh, making this world better, then collectively uh, we can have an impact. Oh, thank energy uh, professional, future energy professionals like you. I think we may be in good hands. Thank you very much, Belnor. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. And, and that's, I, uh, I found it's my purpose now. We hope you enjoyed this lively panel discussion and gained some insight into the future of oil and gas. It's a complex topic, but it's clear that oil and gas is not going away anytime soon. And we will need to adapt as well as transform away from fossil fuels. OPEC forecasts that oil demand will continue to grow over the next two decades. Should we expect the fossil fuel industry to help lead the energy transition? Can oil and gas industry align its vision and redirect its resources and human capital to transitioning away from fossil fuels? Perhaps the oil and gas industry is critical to the energy transition. If we could align our visions, collaborate and not confront and bring all voices to the table, we must bring all hands on deck to face this global challenge. Oil and gas has allowed our global economy to come this far, but we do have to pollute to get rich the future of the energy transition may need the contribution of the oil and gas industry as they reconsider their business models in our changing world. The energy transition is up to the changes we are willing to make as individuals and as a society. And until next time, we hope you understand a little more about the story of the energy transition because the energy transition is up to you and me. We would like to thank the USC Oshagi Center for Energy Transition, which aims to develop innovations in energy technologies and foster the transition to a low carbon future for sponsoring this podcast. Special thanks also to our guests for today and Abhi, our technical guru, for their important contributions to our podcast. And a special shout out to Balnor's mom. I'm sure Balnor has made her very proud. Now it's our turn with the energy transition to make her proud of us. Thank you all for tuning in to Energy Transition Talk. We would appreciate it so much if you could leave a rating and review and subscribe to our podcast so that you can automatically get access to our new episodes. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Justine. I'm Jim. And I'm Paulina, signing off from Energy Transition Talk. Stay tuned for the next episode.